Greg looked awkward when I found him at the bar, but he smiled and said, There you are, boy. How about you grab a pitcher and sit in a booth? As we sat there, we chatted for a few minutes about the Reds and whether they had a chance this season, and we came to the conclusion that third place was the best they could hope for, and about the latest political scandal. The mayor's chief of staff and the treasurer of the Catholic Diocese of Cincinnati had the same call girl. At least the story was original, and about some of the latest office gossip at Brockton Publishing, where he was a colleague of my wife Susan. But I knew Greg had something on his mind, some reason why he was asking me to meet him for a beer. Finally, I just said, So Greg, what did you want to talk to me about? There was a short silence, during which Greg looked more nervous than ever. He cleared his throat and hesitated several times. Then he said, Look, Andy, Susan said. I mean, she told me that... I was just waiting. His eyes were glued to my face. I really had no idea what he was going to say. Susan said that I should never mention this to you, that you like to keep it a secret. So, forgive me if I do wrong, you know? I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, it's just... Well, I need to make sure you really don't mind. With what? I asked, still not understanding what we were talking about. He licked his lips, looking unhappy. With... You know, with the game. The game that you and Susan play where she, uh... You know, she... He made a vague gesture with his hands, and his voice broke as he looked at me begging me to somehow finish his sentence. Sorry, Greg, I said. I still don't understand you. There was a long silence. Greg stared at me and I swear I saw him turn pale. I waited again, motioning for him to continue. And finally, reluctantly, he said, Andy, don't you know about, about Susan, you know, that she had, had sex with other guys? Greg had joined Susan at Brockton about a year earlier leaving a low-level position at a New York publishing house to come to Cincinnati. He was about 28 years old, about 10 years younger than Susan and I. Greg was a big, heavy-set guy, good-looking in his own way. He was single, but seemed to have no problem finding female companionship. In fact, I saw him at book parties in Brockton, with several different attractive women. Of course, he met Susan first because they worked together, but I really liked him having discovered that we had a common interest in baseball, which bored Susan to tears, we had gone to a couple of Reds games the previous summer and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. We also worked out at the same gym, and from time to time, Susan and I would invite him to dinner. He was a good guy, and I enjoyed his company. However, now I felt my face turn red with anger, and I said quietly, Greg, what the hell are you talking about? Greg pulled back from me to the other side of the booth. He was four inches and 30 pounds bigger than me, but he looked completely scared. Andy, I... I swear to God she told me it was a game you two played, that it turned you both on. I don't... It's incredible, man. He moved to get out of the booth, but I put my hand on his arm. Hold on, Greg. I took a deep breath and forced myself to speak quietly. I'll stay calm, I promise and I'm not going to hit you or anything like that. But you can't just walk away from here. You have to tell me what the hell Susan told you. He nodded and sat back down heavily. Okay, Andy, it's just... Jesus Christ, I can't believe you don't know about this. I stared at him, my thoughts swirling. Susan told me that... that you two were playing a game. That you both are turned on by the idea of her having sex with other guys and then coming home and telling you about it. And she said that part of the game was complete secrecy, that none of the men she had sex with were ever to mention it to you. We should never have disclosed that we had sex with her or that you knew anything about it. Part of the thrill for you two, she said, was pretending it was a secret affair. And she also said that, well, that you felt a little awkward, that it turned you on, that other guys were, you know, having sex with Susan. And she made me swear that I would never say a word to you about it. But I, I just couldn't do it, Andy. It seemed too damn weird to me, and I had to double check with you to make sure everything was really okay. He must have seen from my face that I was stunned, and he looked more miserable than ever. Finally, I said, so you slept with Susan? Slowly, reluctantly, he said, yes, we did it twice. 
Once two weekends ago when your mom was sick and you were in Louisville for an overnight stay. And then again on Tuesday afternoon. We took a day off from work and went to my apartment. There was a long silence. My mind was racing a thousand miles an hour. Shock, rage, sadness, self-deprecation. How the hell could I not know about this? Finally, I said, And she convinced you that I was involved in this? That I'm okay with this being part of the sex game we played with her? He nodded, relieved that my hands weren't around his throat. It sounded perverted, I admit, but she was so convincing. Said you guys have been playing like this for years and that it really turns you on? He frowned. Actually, that's exactly what she said. It really turns Andy on. He's all over me when I tell him about it. And she gave me this big, sexy smile. We sat for a couple more minutes. Finally, I said, Greg, if it wasn't already obvious, I didn't know a damn thing about any of this. I thought I was married to a loving, wonderful woman, not a cheating bitch. I need to think about this. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Needless to say, it was quite a shock. I laughed good-naturedly. Then I leaned forward and looked at him intently. Do two things for me, okay? First, don't sleep with Susan again. Of course, Andy, I would never... Greg nodded vigorously at me. And secondly, don't tell her you talked to me. If she suggests meeting up again, just make up some excuse. I need to figure out how to deal with this. And I need you to keep her completely in the dark. Greg nodded again. I give you my word, Andy. And look, I... I swear to you, I would never have touched Susan if I... You know, if I didn't believe that you wanted it too. You're my friend, dude, and I feel like complete crap. He looked at me with tears in his eyes and I had no idea how to answer him. Should I try to make him feel better or grab a tire iron and beat him to death? After Greg left, I pulled myself together and called home. Luckily, Susan wasn't home yet, so I left a plausible-sounding message that I was late at work, let her eat without me. I knew I needed time. There was no way I could meet her right away. I walked around the corner to a diner and ate a burger and salad without tasting a single bite. For all I knew, it could have been borscht and a shrimp salad sandwich. I guess I was a typical cuckold husband, because I had no idea that there was anything wrong with my marriage. I simply adored Susan and was sure that she loved me. We were married 14 years, no children. A nice cozy house near Burnett Woods, two jobs that we enjoyed. We traveled a lot, saw friends and relatives, and generally enjoyed our life together. Susan is short and blonde, with large breasts and big curves. She was more cute than beautiful, but her sexy figure always attracted attention, and she seemed to enjoy it. In fact, she was flirty with me at the party where we first met, and for years I watched her flirt with guys at other parties we went to. You know, laughing and joking, maybe dancing too close, or even letting someone touch her, and it never bothered me, because I knew that she loved me and would go home with me. What a fucking idiot I was. I imagine our sex life was pretty average for a couple like us. We made love maybe a couple of times a week, more when we were on vacation, perhaps almost every day, and less when we were busy at work or during the holidays when we visited family. It may have been a routine, but I would say it was a satisfying routine. Like every married couple, we both had things we liked. I knew how to please her. She knew how to excite me too. So what if we often did the same thing in bed? I always thought it was great, although what I had to offer probably wasn't enough to satisfy Susan. You'd think that by the time I finished dinner, I'd be ready to go home and kick my cheating wife out of the house. But I wasn't yet. It was like hearing that a loved one had died in an accident. My mind just couldn't process the news. I kept thinking that this must all be some kind of mistake, and I realized that I needed to hear the whole story from Greg, everything Susan had told him, before I could start processing it and figure out what the hell I should do. I didn't think I could pretend to Susan that everything was normal that night, but somehow I did. She greeted me kindly, as always, and we chatted about our work days while I bought myself some ice cream. She even snuggled up to me in bed, although, thank God, she didn't seem to want to make love. I think I would have ended up just strangling her. As soon as I could tell from her breathing that she had fallen asleep, 
I carefully pulled away from her and rolled over to my side of the bed. I didn't even want to touch her. My dreams that night were terrible. An endless series of men having sex with Susan. Needless to say, it was a pretty terrible night. I called Greg the next morning as soon as Susan left for work and agreed to meet him for lunch. He was a little reluctant at first, but I had no trouble letting him know that I wanted to hear the whole story. Last night, I was too shocked to process everything he told me. After a morning spent staring at the wall of my office, trying and failing to concentrate on any aspect of my work, I met Greg at a small Greek restaurant on Calhoun Street. By mutual agreement, we ate first, and then I asked him to tell me the whole story again. From the very beginning, Greg, you can probably imagine that I had a hard time dealing with this last night. Actually, I didn't learn that much new. Susan went out for drinks with Greg about three weeks earlier and basically hit on him. She told him about our game and that she was attracted to him. That day, he blew her off, mostly because he was more stunned than anything else. It seemed like such a far-fetched story, and the thought of me being a good friend and sleeping with her made him feel uncomfortable. But they talked about it several more times over the next few days, and when she told him on Friday that I was going to Louisville for the weekend, he agreed to meet her at the motel. She actually offered our house, but Greg said the idea scared him. Greg, understandably, didn't want to tell me about the sex in detail, but it was obvious that it was hot. Susan would have been desirable to almost any man, and Greg made it clear that she was passionate, athletic, and tireless. They did this two or three times every time they got together, enjoying lots of petting and exploring different positions. I clenched my teeth but didn't say anything. She liked to say dirty things, he said, warily watching my face. She said she got pleasure from saying dirty things to me, knowing that she would come home and repeat it all to you. I asked him to tell me everything Susan said about the game and how long it lasted. Apparently it's been a few years at least. She didn't say exactly, he told me, but I realized that she had several boyfriends before me. She said that she always had one buddy, that was her word, buddy, and that she had sex with him for several months before breaking up with him. She said that after a while, you weren't as interested in talking to her if it was the same guy. You liked hearing about someone new. He winced. Man, I'm so sorry. I know, Greg. She deceived you. Forget it. Look, did she tell you anything about how it all started and who the guys were before you? I don't know how it all started, he said, but she mentioned a couple of guys. None of the names meant anything to me except Arnold Morrison. That guy from the city council. Yes, Greg said. She said she met him when there was a book party in Brockton for some political book they published two to three years ago. Susan also said that you never knew any of her playmates personally before me. It looks like she did this on purpose, so that you would have no chance of finding out what she was up to. Then did she tell you why she followed you? He looked awkward again. She... she said I was too delicious to resist. He covered his face with his hand for a moment. Andy... Oh my God, you probably want to fucking kill me. I feel like the lowest piece of trash on earth. Gloomily, I said, I don't blame you, Greg. Many guys would be happy to take a piece from Susan without thinking about her husband. And she gave you this false story. I can't say that I wouldn't believe it either if all this happened to me. What really matters is that Susan cheated on me. For years, apparently. How she must enjoy deceiving me and pulling the wool over my eyes. I sat staring into space. Greg didn't say anything. There were a lot of questions in my head about what the hell I was going to do. How should I deal with Susan? Will I continue to pretend to be a loving husband and remain completely ignorant? Will I be able to stand up to her and throw her ass out? Or will I mope around for a while and let her worry? But I already had an answer to one question. Our marriage was over. Susan was history. At least it was a story, if what Greg told me turned out to be true. As shocked and enraged as I was, I couldn't just shoot an arrow at her without knowing for sure. I called my friend Brian and arranged to meet him for dinner. Then I left another message for Susan saying I was having dinner with Brian and would be home later that evening.
Brian was my oldest and best friend. We met when he was president of Zeta Beta Tau, the fraternity I joined in college. We were very close. I was best man at his wedding to Emily, and he was my best man when I married Susan. He had known Susan almost as long as I had, and I knew that he and Emily loved her. So he was just as stunned to hear the story as I was. Brian was amazing, just like I knew he would be. He let me tell it my way, asking just a few questions along the way. He was patient and supportive, even handing me a tissue without a word when I cried. We're not the kind of friends who say I love you to each other, but I knew he was in my corner and that helped a lot. When I finally finished speaking, he quietly asked me, Do you know what you're going to do, Andy? Two things, I said. So far, I only know two things. First, I must be absolutely sure that this is indeed true. I still can't believe it, you know? I mean, I was so sure that Susan loved me. And second, if this is true, then Susan is in for some very unpleasant times. I can't forgive and forget. That's not it. It's over between us, and from the way I'm feeling right now, it's not going to be pretty. He nodded. I can hardly blame you. Believe me. Then he said, How can Emily or I help? Emily. She and Susan were friends too, although not as close as Brian and I. Look, are you willing to keep this a secret even from Emily for the next few days? Of course, dude. We usually don't hide anything from each other, but this is a special case. I won't say a word to her until you give me the go-ahead. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. I sat down and thought for a moment. The only name I have for one of Susan's friends is Arnold Morrison, and I was hoping you could help me find him. He has no idea who I am, but he'll probably want to talk to you. Brian was a political writer, a columnist for Time magazine, but he covered politics for nearly a decade for the Cincinnati Inquirer and was respected by everyone in the local political scene. I can do this without any problems, he said, and we discussed for some time how to arrange everything. We then discussed how I should behave around Susan. Brian told me to pull myself together and pretend to be myself, not to give her even a hint that something was wrong until I was absolutely sure about everything. I shrugged and said, I'm not sure I can do it, but I'll try. And in fact, I did almost as well as the previous night. Again, thank God Susan pressed herself against me, but did not ask me to have sex. Two days later, at 10.30 a.m., Brian and I sat in Arnold Morrison's large office, looking across the desk at him as he greeted Brian and me cordially. They greeted each other a little. How are you? What does old so-and-so do? And then he said pleasantly, Well, Brian, what's on your mind? He was a tall guy, just under 50. Quite handsome, I think, although a little cute, as is often the case with politicians. And he had that demeanor that many politicians have. He seemed very sincere and very interested in you. Is that what attracted Susan? I have no idea. Arnie, I'm here on a very private matter, and you can be sure that we will keep this conversation confidential. I assume you've met my friend Andy's wife, Susan Cullen. Morrison did a very good job of keeping his face straight, but I saw his eyes widen slightly. Calmly, he said, I think I met her, Brian, but I don't remember exactly when or where. I leaned forward. Mr. Morrison, I have no intention of ruining your life if you are completely honest with us, but I know you had sex with my wife and I need to hear the whole story. The guy was a pretty cool client, I have to give him credit. He looked at us thoughtfully for a full minute, but without any panic on his face. Then he said, more to Brian than to me, is this completely off the record? Totally, Brian answered. This is not for what I write. This is a personal matter. They don't write about this, it won't reach your wife. This will stay with the three of us. And you don't write it down? I'm not writing it down, Brian said. Actually, I was recording, I had a little digital recorder in my jacket pocket, but neither of us told Morrison about it. He sat for another minute, still calm and thoughtful. Then he sighed. I have a feeling I don't know the whole story either, Mr. Cullen, he said, looking at me. Am I right that you didn't know about my, uh, activities with Mrs. Cullen? Absolutely, I said. Well, he said and stopped. Well, yes. I had an affair with Susan, about two years ago. 
We met at some publishing party at a reception on the occasion of the release of a new book. He leaned forward, looking at me intently. But I swear to you that she told me that you know all about it. She called it a game, actually. She said that she and her husband, sorry you, enjoyed her sleeping around. She would come home and tell you about it every time, and it would really spice up your sex life. But she also made it clear that you were pretending to know nothing about her affairs and that I should never mention it to you. It wasn't a problem since we were unlikely to meet. And I didn't want my wife to find out anyway, so we were pretty careful. How long have you been dating her? I asked him. To my surprise, I was completely calm, as if we were not talking about the complete destruction of the most important relationship in my life. He thought for a moment. Maybe three, three and a half months. It started in late spring, and I remember she broke up with me around Labor Day. She said it was fun, but after a while, she and her husband became less interested in the same guy, and she needed to find someone else. It all seemed quite perverted to me, but Susan is a very sexy woman. I never had any complaints. He saw the pain on my face and said, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. It's okay, I said. I believed him that he thought he was playing a perverted game and not helping a woman cheat. As I told Greg, in the same situation, I could do the same thing. I definitely would if I were single. Where did you meet? In different places. We had to be careful. Obviously, I'm in the public eye to some extent, but I'm on the board of public housing committee, and it's pretty easy for me to get the keys to some of the empty apartments in the buildings that the city controls. I was just saying that my staff was doing random checks. We usually met during the week for lunch and sometimes spent the whole day together. Were there nights or weekends? I asked. Two or three times when, uh, when Susan said you were out of town. He looked awkward again. I came up with some story to tell my wife, and we spent the night at your house. I'm so sorry, Mr. Cullen. I nodded. I didn't need to ask him what the sex was like, imagining it was bad enough. Has she ever told you about her other lovers? Or about how long she and I were supposedly doing this? I think she once said that I was the fourth or fifth guy she'd done it with. I remember that she flattered me. She said, and you are the best of all of them or something like that. It was most likely nonsense, but I didn't mind when I heard it. We sat in silence for another minute. Is there anything else you can tell me? I asked him. No, I do not think so. I'm very sorry, he said. I don't hold a grudge against you, I replied. You cheated on your wife, but that's your business. As for Susan, I can't blame you for believing her story. Morrison looked at Brian. Confidential? he asked again. Brian nodded and stood up to shake Morrison's hand. I give you my word, Arnie. I'm sorry we had to put you in a difficult position, but my friend needs to know the truth. Of course, he said, and politely led us to the exit. At the corner, Brian stopped and put his hand on my shoulder. Are you okay? I sighed. Yes. I knew what I'd hear. It's just, well, it's one thing to know it and another to have it confirmed. The last nail in the coffin. Do you want to sit and talk? Or have lunch? Or even go score a bucket of balls? No thanks, Brian. I'll be okay. I'm going to walk in the park until I'm hungry. Then I'll have a snack and go back to work. But do you mind if I invite you and Emily to dinner tomorrow night? I'm starting to make some plans, and it would be great if you both could discuss them with us. Brian said that of course he would work it out with Emily. I thanked him again for his help with Morrison. God, it's great to have one true friend. As I got out of the car in the driveway that evening, I thought, damn, another night where I have to pretend I don't know what my bitch wife has been up to. And then I thought, why should I pretend? I'm not ready to confront her, but there's no reason not to get on her nerves a little. Susan was getting dinner on the table when I walked into the kitchen, and she smiled and said, hello, honey, the food will be ready in a minute, and kissed me. I smiled and took a bottle of wine from the refrigerator. For the first few minutes of dinner, she chatted about her day, then finally she started to notice that I wasn't talking much. Rauv day, Andy. You look awfully quiet. Yes, actually, I said, looking at her. Quite heavy. I seem to have discovered that I can't always count on the people I thought I could count on. I'm sorry, 
she said, looking serious. Is it something at work? I've heard you complain a couple of times lately about Hank's staff. I don't think I should talk about this now, I replied, leaving it hanging. I sat looking directly at her for a moment longer. Then, without saying a word, I stood up to clear away our plates. Walking around the table, I noticed that she was looking at me with concern. When I returned to the dining room with two slices of the apple pie she had bought, her face was flushed, but she pulled herself together and thanked me with a warm smile. We ate dessert in silence at first, until Susan made a couple of awkward attempts to restart the conversation, talking first about the new neighbors across the street and then about the wonderful vacation one of her work friends was going on. When we finished dessert, she stood up and walked over to my chair. Leaning over and hugging me, she rubbed her cheek against mine and said, Would you like some coffee? Or something else tasty and hot? I couldn't help but think that if I had received a similar invitation on another evening, not when I had just learned of her years-long infidelity to me, I would have been delighted. Instead, her suggestion only increased my rage. I stood up, breaking away from her embrace, and said, No, thank you. I need to do some paperwork. Without looking back, I left the room and walked down the corridor to my office, leaving her watching me go. I didn't know how shocked or scared she was, but I knew that I had hurt her at least a little, and that was fine with me. I planned to stay late and come to the bedroom after she was asleep, but around ten I was tired and thought, fuck it, why should I avoid her? So I went to get ready for bed, noticing that she was already in bed watching TV. I undressed, went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth and climbed into bed without saying a word. She quickly turned off the TV, leaving only my bedside lamp in the room. She rolled over to face me, and I saw that she was wearing one of her shorter, sexier nightgowns, not at all typical for a regular weeknight. Susan leaned against my chest and muttered, Would you mind a little love, Andy? I turned away, turning over so that my back was to her. At the same time, I said, No, not today, good night. And I reached out and turned off the light. You can rest assured that I have never done anything like this before. I refused sex to Susan very rarely, a couple of times when I had a migraine or when I needed to finish a work project, maybe four or five times throughout our marriage, and never without explanation. So my behavior was as big a red flag as it could be. But Susan didn't say a word. She didn't ask, is everything okay? Or, are you angry? She didn't ask me anything, because, of course, she was afraid of the conversation that might follow. Susan falls asleep easily, and most often I hear her even calm breathing within a couple of minutes after she turns off the light, while it always takes me a little longer. But not today. Half an hour later, she was still awake, and still had not said a word. I smiled grimly to myself in the darkness. Of course, I didn't sleep either. Basically, I was thinking about all the times we had sex, and I didn't even know I was getting sloppy seconds. All those teams when I happily made love to the only woman in my life, thinking that I was the only man in her life. I lay awake for a long time and was very, very angry. Woke up early, took a quick shower, drank a cup of coffee, and was in the office by 7.30 without saying a word to Susan. I had a lot to do. I left a note on my boss's desk saying I wanted to talk to him as soon as he arrived, and then I sat and made lists of credit cards and bank accounts, possible movers, and other logistical things I needed to take care of. At 8.15, Lionel poked his head in and said, Good morning, Andy. Did you want to see me? Yes, thank you, Lionel. Can we talk here for a minute? I got up to close the door. I worked with Lionel Brundage for almost ten years. I considered him not only a friend, but also a boss, and I decided that I had to trust him. Please keep this a complete secret, okay, Lionel? I'm afraid I have bad news. I found out that Susan cheated on me, and I'm going to leave her. As soon as I can, really. So I wanted to know the name of that bounty hunter who called you about me last year. One executive search firm showed interest in me, although the conversation never went very far because at the time I was perfectly happy to stay where I was. Lionel was stunned and said so. In fact, the word Jesus featured prominently in his first remarks. 
But, as we discussed everything, he got over his shock and wanted to be helpful, just as I had hoped. By 10.15 a.m., I called the company and spoke with the guy who was interested in me last year. At 10.45 a.m., I faxed my resume to him, and at 2.25 p.m., we were on the phone again, discussing three suitable positions. The best one was working as a fundraiser for a large nonprofit organization in Chicago. The job was much like what I was doing now, but with more support staff and the salary would have been at least 20% higher. They had been trying to fill the vacancy for almost four months and were ready to act quickly. I told the headhunter to let the nonprofit know that I was interested and could get an interview as soon as possible. I was getting ready to leave the office at about 5.50 when the phone rang and a loud voice said, Mr. Cullen, I'm Ted Ruska with Global Resources in Chicago. I understand you might be interested in our position on fundraising. We had an amazing conversation for almost half an hour, at the end of which he invited me to Chicago to meet with the board of directors. The trip will take place in two days, and I gladly accepted the invitation. Dinner with Brian and Emily was both reassuring and painful, encouraging because it reminded me that I have two truly amazing friends supporting me. Painful because I had to tell Emily the story, which meant going through it all again. She was stunned and full of compassion and concern for me, and just furious with Susan. What a bitch, she said quietly, and I saw that her fists clenched. I just can't believe it. She looked at me, and seeing the pain on my face, her gaze softened. I'm so sorry, Andy, she said, taking my hand. What can Brian and I do to help? Just be my friends, I said, wiping away a couple of tears. I know I can get through this, but I have to admit that being myself right now kind of sucks. But knowing that I have you two to talk to helps a lot. Brian squeezed my shoulder, and they both told me how much they wanted to help in any way they could. We ate our dinners, and I told them my plans. Get a job out of town and just disappear. I wasn't interested in destroying Susan or publicly humiliating her. I just wanted to leave and I wanted her to wake up one day and suddenly find that her marriage was over, her husband was gone. That would be punishment enough. I told them about a potential job in Chicago. This sounds very promising, and if everything works out, I will almost certainly agree. And then I'll just disappear and let Susan go crazy trying to find me. I knew I couldn't hide forever, but I intended to explain my situation to my new employers and ask them to hold off on publicly announcing my hiring for a month or so. With a new cell phone number and a new email account, and Lionel's cooperation at work, I was confident that I could remain undetected for a couple of weeks, long enough to cause Susan some distress. So, when this all blows over, I'm going to ask you guys to lie for me because I'm sure you'll be the first one she calls. Just tell her that you don't know anything about it. Emily smiled grimly. And to think, I considered her one of my best friends. Andy, you know you can count on us. And I'm looking forward to telling her what I think when she calls. This selfish liar. Well, she said, a little embarrassed. I think you can understand what I think about what she did. Does this mean I can count on you to be faithful to me, baby? Brian asked, teasingly. She playfully slapped his arm. Yeah, that means... And you better not have anything behind my back, big guy, unless you want to be left without your dignity. We all burst into laughter, and our dinner turned into a relaxed evening full of humor and affection. I am almost, almost was able to forget about the suffering and rage that I carried within me nonstop for several days. When I returned home, it was late. The bedroom was dark, but Susan was still awake. During the workday, she sent me several friendly, light-hearted emails, but the only thing I did was send a short reply, reminding her that I would be home late after dinner. I didn't say with whom. Hey, baby. Her voice rang out in the darkness, delightfully relaxed and sleepy. I was painfully reminded of how much I loved Susan and how sexy I still found her. If only this were all just a nightmare. If only I could believe that I still have a faithful, loving wife and dive into her arms. How was dinner? I missed you today. Everything was fine, I said bluntly. I had dinner with Brian and Emily. It's nice to have friends, people you can trust. She sat down. But why not? 
she left the question unfinished. Just like the night before, she was afraid to say anything that might lead to a conversation she didn't want to have, and so she was stuck. Tao shit, I thought to myself. Instead of saying anything else, Susan waited silently while I got ready for bed, and when I lay down, she rolled over and took me in her arms. You failed me last night, baby, she purred in my ear, pressing her beautiful soft breasts against me. Any chance I'll get some of that good love today? I chuckled to myself. I'm sorry, Susan, I said, turning away from her hug. I'm still worried about the problem I told you about, and I'm really not in the mood. I could practically hear her mind racing. After silence, she said, Okay, honey, I understand. But I hope we make love soon. I miss you so much. She lovingly stroked my arms and shoulders and then moved to her side of the bed. Once again, it took her quite a long time to fall asleep, and it took me even more time. Over the next few days, everything moved quickly. My trip to Chicago to interview with the Global Resources Council went very well, and I accepted the job starting in 10 days. I immediately spoke with Lionel, who was understanding that I notified him so quickly. We agreed that I would continue to consult with him part-time for a month or so until my replacement got up to speed. I owed him a lot, and I made sure he knew I wouldn't let him down. Four days later, I made a second trip to Chicago, working with a real estate agent whom Ted Ruska knew, and found a nice two-bedroom apartment just minutes from my new office. I signed the lease, then quickly went to the furniture store and bought everything I needed to decorate the apartment. I arranged for the manager of my new building to handle the delivery, so everything was ready when I arrived. I even made arrangements with Eileen Stambaugh, who would become my new administrative assistant, to purchase bed linens, towels, and some basic kitchen supplies. Eileen was happy to help, especially after I promised her dinner at the best restaurant in Chicago. By the time I returned to Cincinnati for the second time, there wasn't much left to do. I needed to clear out my office at the university, pack my clothes and other things I was taking with me from home, and make all the financial arrangements to separate my life from Susan's. I could do everything except packing in my office, and it was all finished by Friday. Susan had little reason to worry about my trips out of town, since I traveled quite often for work. But my coldness definitely made her worry, and I enjoyed watching her try to figure out what to do. She didn't want to bring up what was bothering me, because she was undoubtedly afraid that I would begin to suspect her of infidelity. Therefore, all she could do was be affectionate and loving, and my rude refusals to all her advances clearly upset and frightened her. Emily called me at work and, with a sort of malicious glee, told me that Susan had called her to see if she knew anything about what was bothering me. I enjoyed every minute, Andy, she told me. I made Susan tell me about everything that you were acting strangely, not responding to her affectionate hugs and kisses, refusing her sex, hinting that there was some kind of problem, but not telling you about it. So I asked her, is there anything you could do that would upset Andy in any way? She sighed and said, no, I don't know about anything. And then I asked, well, did you insist that he tell you what the problem is? And she hesitated and said that she didn't want to put too much pressure on you, that she was sure you would tell her when you were ready. It was so obvious what she was afraid of. This is how she tried to squeeze information out of me while keeping her own disgusting behavior a secret. I shared Emily's pleasure in the call and asked her to keep me updated, and I let her know that I was ready to make my move. Monday would be the right day. That weekend I continued to act mysterious and distant. My own anger at Susan had certainly not diminished, and I was determined to make my last two days of her life as miserable as possible. I spoke to her very little, and to every warm or cordial suggestion she made, I responded with rude coldness. When she asked if we could go for a walk on Saturday, today is such a wonderful day, dear. I stared at her and then said that I didn't want to. When she suggested a variety of things we could do together on Saturday night, such as going out to dinner, watching a movie, or hanging out with friends, I said I wanted to stay home and watch TV. Then, as she settled down next to me on the couch, I waited about ten minutes until the end of the show we were watching 
and then stood up abruptly. I just remembered that I need to finish a couple of reports, I said, and disappeared into my office. I went to bed late after Susan had fallen asleep, and on Sunday morning I woke up to her cuddling up to me, tenderly kissing my neck and her soft hand trying to turn me on. When I opened my eyes, she smiled at me and said, Great! You woke up and the baby wants to play. She rolled onto me and tried to kiss me, but I held her back by placing both hands on her shoulders. Susan, stop it, I said. I don't force you to have sex when you don't want it, and I would appreciate the same attention from you. I slipped out from under her and stood up from the bed, reaching for my robe. She looked upset. But honey, we haven't made love for, I don't know, two weeks. Really? Really did. I do something to... Really? Are you really angry with me? This was the closest she came to asking me a direct question about my behavior, a sign of how desperate she was becoming. I don't know, Susan. You tell me. Is there anything you could do to make me angry with you? I said this calmly, but coldly. Silence. She was looking down. Then she said, No, baby. Nothing that I could think of. And she looked at me pleadingly, afraid to say anything else. Then I guess we're done, I said and headed to the kitchen to make coffee. Susan must have been intimidated by our conversation because she spent most of the rest of the day avoiding me. However, I heard her talking on the phone several times. I think she was talking to a friend or lover, for all I know, trying to get help to figure out how to deal with me. While she was at the grocery store, I quickly called Greg to ask if he had spoken to Susan. He said she had talked to him at work two days earlier and asked if he had seen me lately. She said you looked distracted and distant, but she pretended not to know why. So I just told her I wasn't talking to you. That seemed like the easiest thing to do. And then she said that she was looking forward to resuming the game with me. But it was probably better to wait a little until she knew what was bothering you. I pretended to be disappointed, but of course, I agreed. Thank you, Greg. It will all come out soon. Please, whatever you do, don't let her know anything about our conversations, okay? Greg again promised that he wouldn't tell her anything, and we hung up. Monday morning after breakfast, Susan came into the bedroom to finish getting dressed for work and was surprised to see me in sweatpants and sneakers. Aren't you going to the office today, Andy? No. I need to take care of a few things, so I took the day off. She looked at me for a moment. Then, almost timidly, she said, Well, since you're in no hurry, maybe we can make love. She smiled warmly and added, I don't mind being a little late for work. Looking at her, I deliberately forced myself to think about her having sex with Arnold Morrison or some other faceless man. My loving wife is the woman to whom I gave my life. That was all that was required. I said, no, I don't think so, and left the bedroom without looking at her. I went down to the basement to find my suitcases and didn't come up until I heard her car pull out of the driveway. By 11 a.m., I had packed everything I planned to take with me into three suitcases, plus several boxes of books and CDs. I called a taxi, which waited at the post office while I sent the boxes to my apartment in Chicago and then took me to the airport, and by 7.30 p.m., I was finishing up unpacking my things at the new place, after which I went around the corner to eat pizza and drink beer. Frowning, I raised a toast to myself, to the first day of the rest of my life. My new life. My life without Susan. Oh, I almost forgot. Just before I left home, I wrote a short note to Susan, which I left on the kitchen table with my wedding ring and cell phone on top. The note said, I learned about your game. So here's my game. It's called Farewell to the Cheating Bitch. My first week at my new job was busy and exhausting, which was great because I missed Susan like crazy. It's not that I wanted to be with her. It was over. Every time I thought about her, I was overcome with rage. I even admired the grotesque perfection of the way she betrayed me. But just because I was angry and hated her guts didn't mean I didn't miss her. I loved her for so many years, loved everything about her. 
these feelings don't just go away. Instead, they are mixed with new ones. Love and hate swirl together as if they were in a washing machine. Overall, I was very pleased that Global Resources kept me on my toes. When Friday came, I was grateful that I could just come home, watch part of the ball game on TV, and go to bed. But the weekend was difficult. I was new to Chicago, didn't know a soul except my new co-workers, and had to come to terms with the fact that I was once again a single man, not legally, but in every other way. I knew that I would have. To begin the process of meeting people, making friends, trying to find a new woman in my life. And this prospect was extremely depressing. The best part of these two days was the conversation I had on Sunday with Brian and Emily. They supported me and wanted to know how I was doing. I told them my new address and phone number, once again swearing them to secrecy, and Emily was just eager to tell me about meeting Susan. She called us on Monday evening during dinner. She was almost hysterical. She was crying so hard I could barely understand her. But eventually I made out what she was saying. He's gone. Andy's gone. She couldn't calm down, and I told her that I'd be there right away. When I arrived, she was in terrible condition. Her hair was a mess, her makeup was smudged with tears, and she could barely speak coherently. I poured her a drink and then sat down and played sympathetic friend. God, how fun it was. I let her tell me everything about how she came home from work and found you gone and your engagement ring lying on the table. I asked her why on earth would you do that and if you left a note or something. And then, Emily said with glee, she looked at me and cried even harder and finally she said, Oh, Emily, I... I cheated on him. I pretended to be completely shocked. I think I said something like, No, Susan, you didn't cheat. And I acted very angry got up and walked around the kitchen, stopping and looking at her all the time. She looked guilty and scared. Finally, I said, I'm sorry, Susan, but I just can't stay here right now. I love both you and Andy, and I can't believe you would do something like that to him. He was the best, the most loving. And then I just said, I'll talk to you in a few days when I calm down, and left. I left her right there in the kitchen, with tears in my eyes. Even over the phone, it was easy to hear the satisfaction in Emily's voice. I knew that Susan would be frantic to find me. And frankly, I was hoping that not being able to find me would drive her crazy. The fact that I missed her so much made me even angrier. How dare she, the woman I gave so much of myself to, act so incredibly selfish and make me so damn miserable. Over the next two weeks, I kept in touch with Brian and Emily. They were like a lifeline for me, allowing me to talk about things in Chicago, about my new job, and sometimes about how lonely and empty I felt. They listened to me patiently and advised me to hold on. They were great. Susan called them every day and asked if they knew anything about where I had gone. According to them, she was desperate. I also quickly called Lionel, who told me that Susan came to see him the day after I left. She almost fainted when she found out that I had quit my job and left no address. After my third week in Chicago, I flew back to Cincinnati at the invitation of Brian and Emily and spent the weekend with them. It was a great chance to relax and take my mind off the pain I was carrying within myself. Over dinner on Saturday, Emily told me about her last visit from Susan. She came to see me on Thursday, still trying to find you, still in complete despair. She's talking about hiring a private investigator or something to find you. She has this idea that if she can talk to you, then you will be able to understand everything and you will forgive her. I raised my eyebrows. Unlikely, I would say. But I'm interested to hear her version. Did she tell you about this? Emily's eyes sparkled. I said, listen, Susan, you've been moaning and groaning about losing Andy for three weeks now. We've been friends for years. When the hell are you going to tell me what you really did? How bad was it? And she told you? Well, Emily, I have all your attention. Lay it out. That evening, I learned a hell of a lot about my wife, and none of it I wanted to know. Emily began by telling the story of Susan's first betrayal with some charming British man she met at a book party. He chatted with her throughout the event and invited her out for drinks afterwards. Emily said, then she told him that she was a married woman and couldn't just leave with him. 
but instead of telling him off, she asked what hotel he was staying at and then said she would meet him at the bar in one whore. And then they met, drank, went up to his room and went to bed together. I sat staring out the window. It wasn't news after all. I'd known she'd been cheating for years, and it had to be the first time. But it really hurt. She said why? I asked her about it, believe me. And she looked embarrassed and said, I was bored. I know that's no excuse, Emily, but it's the truth. Andy and I had a great life and a good sex life, but it was the same thing all the time. Nothing special. Or another. So predictable, you know? And then this sexy guy showed up with a great accent, and I thought, wow, this is going to shake things up. She said the sex was a lot of fun, nothing cosmic, just exciting because it was someone else after all these years. And that the next week, she tried to have more sex with you, and it was better than usual. And then, she said, she told herself it was a win-win situation. She can have sex every now and then, discreetly, discreetly. And it will spice up her sex life with you at home, and everyone will be better off for it. Can you believe this shit? Over the next hour or so, Emily told me the rest. Susan gradually got into the habit of finding a guy for sex every couple of months. At first these were one-time dates, but then the fifth or sixth guy turned out to be amazing in bed, and she wanted to meet him again. Their affair lasted three months until he became engaged to the woman he was dating. According to Emily, Susan realized that after the first time, extramarital sex became even hotter as she and her new lover learned to please each other. So her new plan was to have short-term affairs, six, ten, maybe twenty times with a guy, until the excitement began to wane. What about the game? I asked. She said it started when the guy she was sleeping with started getting possessive. It occurred to her that one of her lovers might become too attached to her and threatened to tell you about it. So she decided that if they thought she was sleeping with him with your knowledge and permission, then they would know that she would never leave you and that she would not be vulnerable to blackmail. She was damn proud of herself for this little idea, I have to say. She even giggled a little when she told me. Brian brought me another beer and I sipped it, thinking dark thoughts. Nothing Emily told me was much different from what I had imagined, and yet listening to it was indescribably painful. To feel like such an idiot, to feel like I judged so poorly the person I loved and trusted more than anything in the world. How could I be such an idiot? She was bored. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, don't all married couples get a little bored, a little callous? But what's the right way to deal with it? Come to me and say, honey, let's find some fun ways to spice up your relationship. Vacations, toys, role-playing games, but don't sleep with other guys. I don't remember ever being bored with her, but of course there were times when sex was a chore. Still enjoyable, but routine. And God knows, I would be very happy to try something new. Not that I have ever been given such an opportunity. No, Susan decided to spice up her own sex life, not mine. As I prepared to fly to Chicago on Sunday, Brian asked me what I was going to do with Susan. Are you just going to leave her to her fate and wonder what happened to you? Or are you planning to somehow end her life once and for all? I shook my head. I haven't decided yet to tell the truth. Maybe one thing and then another. Maybe I'll just let this drag on until she finds me and then have a nice little surprise. I told him what I was thinking and he chuckled. Sounds perfect, Andy. It's just a pity that I won't be able to be present. To my surprise, several more weeks passed before Susan found out where I was. Brian told me on the phone that she went ahead and hired someone to look for me. So I guess that's what she did. I didn't really care about that. But on Thursday, I came home from work to find a long, rambling message from Susan. Thank God I found you, baby. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I love you more than anything in this world. Please give me a chance to explain everything. I miss you so much. I will anything to make amends. You know you're the only man I love. And another five minutes. Everything in about the same spirit. There wasn't a single word that wasn't completely predictable. Not a single word that would make me less angry. I don't know what she expected, 
You can't cheat on your husband again and again for many years and then say, oops, it's my fault, and he will forgive you and take you back. Sorry, Susan, but that won't happen. So, it looks like it was time to start the denouement. I knew she would keep calling. Simply ignoring her wouldn't work in the long run. The next day, I invited my assistant Eileen to a long lunch. She had become a good friend of mine and already knew most of the unfortunate story of how I unexpectedly came to work at Global Resources. She was a pleasant middle-aged lady, married with three children and very smart. In fact, the best assistant I ever had. I told her what I was planning for Susan and she threw her head back and laughed. I like it, Andy. I can't think of anything more appropriate. She laughed again. She seemed delighted with my idea. Yes, but I'll need help finding someone. I'm not very, uh, let me try, okay? She interrupted me. I have a couple of ideas. Before you do anything else, give me a few days. I raised my eyebrows in confusion. Is it true? She nodded, smiling, and I said, well, okay. But that's hardly what your administrative assistant is typically asked to do. We both laughed. Susan kept calling, at least every other day for the next two weeks. Her messages were shorter, but they weren't anything new, and they certainly didn't make me want to talk to her, let alone forgive her or let her back into my life. On Monday, as I was packing my things and getting ready to leave work, Eileen stopped by to see me. Everything is ready. I have someone perfect for you. Just tell me the day and time, and I'll give her your address. I looked skeptical. Will I be happy with this person? For that matter, Eileen, who the hell is she, and how did you talk her into it? This isn't quite right. Shh, she said with a smile. She'll be perfect, and she really wants to do it. I told her about your situation, and she could hardly wait. She was burning with impatience. And you won't tell me who it is? No, she said, grinning like a Cheshire cat. But trust me, boss, you won't be disappointed. The next day, I left a message on Susan's answering machine. It's me. If you really want to explain everything, you have one chance. This Saturday, at one o'clock in the afternoon in my apartment in Chicago. Don't come early and don't be late. I'll give you one hour. Here's the address. Leave me a message back to confirm you'll be coming. That evening, I didn't answer the phone. Instead, I listened as Susan left me an excited message. Oh my God, thank you, baby. Thank you. I love you so much. Of course, I'll be there on Saturday. Thank you for this chance. I know I can make you understand. I'm so sorry I hurt you and I want to spend the next 60 years making amends to you, etc. The next day, Wednesday, I spoke with Eileen. I made an appointment for 13 Macker on Saturday. Can you ask your mysterious woman to be at my house no later than 12? Of course, she said, but you have to promise that you'll call and tell me the whole story when it's all over. This will be my reward. Emily told me over the phone how excited Susan was. I swear, Andy, she has no idea about anything. She really thinks she'll get you back, like all she has to do is tell you how sorry she is. Honestly, I don't understand how she could fool me like that. We've been friends for almost 15 years. And we talked about everything. About our husbands. About work. About families. And now that I know how selfish and cruel she can be, even if she doesn't see it, of course, I can only wonder how blind I was. I laughed a little bitterly. Listen, Emily, how do you think I feel? I was married to her all this time. I think the real lesson is that people like you, Brian and me, decent, trusting people, people who care about others, usually make the mistake of assuming that the rest of the world is like us. But Susan is not. I spent Saturday morning cleaning out my apartment getting everything in proper shape. I didn't want to look or feel like a victim. I wanted the apartment to look like the home of a happy single guy. The newspapers were thrown into the trash can. The books were neatly placed on the shelves. Everything was wiped down and cleaned. There were even flowers in a vase on the table. When the doorbell rang a little after 12 noon, I opened the door with some trepidation. Hello, please. 
What? Christina. Hello, Andy. She giggled. Maybe I should say, surprise, Andy. Christine Hansen worked as a program specialist at Global Resources and was one of the first people I met when I started working there. She was about 30 or so, which made her about eight years younger than me. And she was stunning. Christina was short, slender, with black hair and the most amazing green eyes I had ever seen. She was elegant and stylish, but at the same time had a surprisingly relaxed and friendly way of communicating with people. She was simply one of the most beautiful women I have ever met. And of course, I was shocked by her appearance when I first met her. But I was also shocked by what Susan had done to me and was in the middle of my first couple of days at a new job and in a new city and was busy trying to remember the names of the other 12 people I was introduced to at the same time time. However, I thought about her often. We saw each other several times a week, in passing or at senior staff meetings, and she was always cordial and cheerful. She seemed to like me, although I wasn't sure if it was just her natural sociability and friendliness. I knew she wasn't wearing a wedding ring, but it was almost impossible for a woman as gorgeous as Christina not to have a boyfriend. So I put her out of my mind as something more than just a co-worker I liked and really enjoyed looking at. It didn't even occur to me to ask Eileen about her and if she was seeing anyone. Now, when she looked around my apartment with an approving expression on her face, I was completely at a loss. Christine, uh, Eileen told you about, about today, right? About my wife and what I was planning? She smiled broadly at me. Absolutely. She gestured to the shopping bag she had brought with her and said, I have everything I need here. But, uh, you... I was still unsure, still amazed, actually. Do you understand that you will... I mean, I... This time, Christina laughed and gently stroked my cheek with the back of her hand. Yes, Andy, I understand. Eileen told me all about your situation what you found out about your wife and all that. She looked more serious and continued, I, let's just say I went through something similar with my ex fiance a little over a year ago, and it's not hard for me to understand how you feel. I'm really sorry, I said. I had no idea. Well, this is not entirely new. I've come to terms with it. But back then, it was pretty awful, and I would give a lot to be able to shove it back down his throat the way you planned to do with Susan. She laughed. So how do you want to arrange this? I suggested we have lunch first, and we spent about half an hour eating sandwiches at my kitchen table, just getting to know each other. I already knew how attractive Christina was, but this dinner confirmed that she is also very smart, funny, and considerate. I wondered if she would be willing to go on a date with me, but that was a question for another day. When it was about 12.45, I said, Christina, if you're sure you're ready for this, maybe it's time for you to go to the bedroom. I'm ready, she said brightly. We decided what would be our signal. Then she leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. This will hurt, Andy. She's been a part of your life for a long time. Don't expect it to be easy. But I will do my best. I promise you that. And with a smile, she disappeared into my bedroom, leaving the door slightly open. I smiled to myself as I put the dishes away and waited for Susan to arrive. The fact that Christina and Not a Stranger became part of today's celebration was a very pleasant surprise. The doorbell rang at 12.58 and I tried to prepare myself for what was to come. Susan stood in the doorway, smiling bravely. She looked scared but beautiful at the same time. She put on an outfit she knew I liked, did some makeup, and appeared to have a new haircut. Hi, Andy, she said quietly, looking like she was about to hug me, but I quickly stepped back, inviting her to enter. Hi, Susan, I said quietly. Would you like something to drink? I bustled around the kitchen for a minute, getting a soda for her and one for myself. I was upset by how fast my heart was beating, how much I was affected by the mixture of love and rage inside me. I knew I needed to calm down and find a way to deal with it. When we sat down, she leaned across the table, looking at me invitingly, and tried to take my hands, but I kept them on my side of the table. Okay, Susan, you're here, and I'll listen to you, even though I don't think you deserve it. She took a deep breath. Baby, I'm so sorry. I did wrong. 
terribly wrong, and I know I caused you so much pain. I was so selfish, so blind and stupid, I just... So, that's enough, I said, interrupting her and raising my hand. I don't want to hear how sorry you are, how much you love me, that it was a mistake, that I had nothing to do with it, that it was just sex. Understood? Don't treat me like an idiot. You slept with other men, a whole string of them, behind my back, for years. I'm right? Shocked by my rage, she nodded her head hesitantly. But honey, I... Do you remember our wedding vows? I asked aggressively, again not letting her finish. Abandon all others? Do you remember agreeing to this, Susan? She nodded again, her face pale. She didn't seem to expect our conversation to go this way, although I couldn't imagine why not. What the hell did she think I'd say? No problem, honey. Fine. We swore fidelity to each other for life, and then at some point, you decided to hell with it and started cheating with whoever you wanted. Tell me, Susan, how many men were there? I don't know, baby. I... Ten? Twenty? Fifty? It was... I... I don't know. Probably twenty. She looked very worried. And how many times did you sleep with them? How many times have you betrayed me? I sat and waited, realizing that I was breathing heavily. My face probably turned red, too. I don't know, baby. She looked at me, hoping for sympathy. Her eyes began to water. Think of it, Susan. Do the math. I'm not in a hurry. I think it will be probably about a couple hundred. Now she was looking down, unable to return my angry gaze. Okay. Let's call it 200. It's a nice round number. Tell me, how many of these times were in our house? In our bed? In our marital bed? I practically screamed. She answered very quietly. I, I guess about, I don't know, Andy, maybe 30. There was silence. So, now that we've got that out of the way, just so we know exactly what we're talking about here, please feel free to explain, Susan. Please tell me why, after what you did, I have to waste time being in the same room with you. Because I love you, Andy. You are the only man I... She was already crying, sobbing between words. The only man I have ever loved... You mean everything to me. I let her talk, let her cry and pleadingly tell me about her love for me, how she was selfish and made a terrible mistake. She thought I would never know that she never meant to hurt me. As if didn't mean to hurt me made everything okay. Everything was as I expected. Not a single word she said had any meaning other than to convince me that she was an infinitely more narcissistic, narcissistic person than I had previously suspected. After a while, I no longer listened to her. Her voice became background noise for my own sad thoughts about the years I had invested in our relationship, about the dreams of our old age together. The rage inside me mixed with sadness. What a waste. And I realized that I would never know why she did it. It seems that she herself did not know. She couldn't name a single reason that made sense to me, other than pure, almost psychopathic selfishness. I raised my head. The kitchen clock said 2.05, and I didn't know how much longer I could stand it, or I want to endure it. In a loud voice, I said, I think we're almost done, Susan. There's nothing more to say. Susan started crying again. But Andy, I can't believe you. There was a noise behind us from the direction of my bedroom, and we both turned to look. My jaw dropped, and I vacuously heard Susan gasping. Baby, you said you'd be done with her in an hour. When are you going back to bed? It was Christina speaking in a low, relaxed, incredibly sexy voice. She posed gracefully, leaning against the doorframe, my open bedroom door. She had somehow managed to smudge her lipstick and style her hair so that she looked like she had spent the previous couple of hours having sex. She wore a long, pale blue peignoir that draped over her, a little like a Roman woman's toga. Except it was stunningly thin and almost transparent. She was absolutely the sexiest thing I had ever seen. I turned to look at Susan, who stood frozen in her chair, stunned. Her face was pale, and she seemed to have somehow withdrawn into herself 
as if she had become smaller and older in a matter of moments. She began shaking her head back and forth, repeating, no, no, over and over again. I got up. Christina's right, Susan. I told you I'd give you an hour, and as you can see, I'm a little busy. Or in any case, I'll be busy again in a few minutes. I smiled coldly at her as I watched her struggle to her feet. Andy, I... Susan began, but then stopped. She looked at Christina again and then at me. I... I didn't know that you... You... Her voice broke and she just stared at me, frozen. Then without saying a word, she stood up, silently crying, walked to the apartment door, opened it, and disappeared down the hallway. I closed the door, then turned and looked at Christina. Christina, I said almost reverently, you are the most incredibly beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. She smiled, bowing her head slightly. Thank you, Andy. It looks like this, she gestured to her negligee, has had the desired effect. I saw that her eyes were full, as if she was about to cry. You destroyed her, I said. She was out of her element. Thank you so much. Continuing to look at her, I could hardly speak. Susan practically disappeared from my consciousness. It helped me too, you know, she said, in some funny, derivative way, as if I was taking it out on Harris, my ex fiance I'm glad, I said, and then, forgive me, I just can't stop watching. Would you like to go back there and change? She just looked at me, and something in her eyes changed. Actually, she said, I was wondering if you could help me with this. I sometimes have trouble getting this thing off. She laughed at my surprised expression and came over to put her arms around my neck tenderly. I'm serious, Andy. It feels right, like the next thing that needs to happen here, for both of us. And then she kissed me, so lightly and sweetly that tears came to my eyes. Making love with Christina was like a miracle, like a dream, only very real. We hugged and touched each other carefully, with love. It took us a long time. There was not a single part of her body that did not arouse my admiration. We lay together, lightly kissing, stroking and caressing, whispering to each other. It was very exciting, but not rushed or feverish. The aftertaste as she sleepily snuggled against me was truly heavenly. I was afraid to utter a word, kindness, or gratitude. I was afraid to break the spell. So we lay together. I felt blissfully happy and hoped that she felt the same. Half an hour later, she muttered that she had to go and got out of bed, gracefully exposing herself. I started to get up, but she gently pressed me back. No, it's okay, Andy. Just rest. She disappeared into the bathroom with her clothes, and when she came out fully dressed, she came and sat next to me on the bed. Leaning over, she smiled and kissed me tenderly. I didn't know this would happen if you're wondering, she told me. But after I heard your conversation with her, I decided that I wanted this. I decided that this was right. Was it a kiss? I thought. Did she tell me kindly that it was a one-time thing? I couldn't say and didn't know what to answer. Thank you, Christina. It was the most loving, most generous and beautiful thing anyone has ever done for me. Smiling, she replied, I did it for myself too, Andy. And you did a lot of good for me, not just for my ego. And with that, she kissed me again, said, no, don't get up, again, and disappeared from the apartment. I slept for a couple of hours, exhausted from both the confrontation with Susan and the extraordinary lovemaking with Christina. And it was real lovemaking, I had no doubt about it. This wasn't just revenge sex, and it was much more than just an act of comfort on her part. I woke up around five o'clock and wandered aimlessly around the apartment, straightening things, a little dazed and thoughtful. Suddenly, without allowing myself to think about the dubious wisdom of what I was doing, I found Christina's number and called her. Hi, this is Andy, I said, suddenly nervous. Hi, Andy, she said, and I heard a smile in her voice. I hope this wasn't too strange for you, I said, not knowing what to say. You were so kind and so incredibly sweet and sexy and, well, I just needed to thank you again and tell you how special you are. It wasn't strange for me at all, she said, just amazing. I'm not usually that spontaneous and, 
Well, I guess what I'm saying is that I need you to know that I don't do this all the time. Just jump into bed with men like this. I would never have thought that. I can say that, that it was something special. I finished unconvincingly. Listen, I said, leaning forward. Would you like to have dinner with me tonight? There are so many great restaurants in Chicago that I have never tried, and I would love to take you to one of them. There was a short pause, and I waited, suddenly horrified. After the longest five seconds of my life, she said, Yes, actually, that would be very nice, Andy. I'd love to. We talked a little about what to eat, what restaurant, when and where I would pick her up. It felt like it was really going to happen, and I felt my whole body smiling. Then she said, Andy, after dinner, is it okay if I come over and stay with you for the night? I invited Brian and Emily multiple times, but it took another three weeks before they could find a free weekend to come visit me in Chicago. They stayed at one of the nice hotels downtown and let me show them around. The lake, the museums, Wrigley Field. Saturday night, we were having drinks at the Fairmont Hotel Bar while waiting for our dinner table. I told them some of the details of my last conversation with Susan. Not that they hadn't heard most of it over the phone, but we all enjoyed my retelling. Suddenly, they put a hand on my shoulder. I jumped up, smiled at the most beautiful pair of green eyes I had ever seen, kissed Christine and said, Emily and Brian, meet Christine Hansen. Christine, this is Emily and Brian O'Halloran. They greeted each other as I helped Christina sit down and ordered her a drink. We began to chat politely, but I noticed that Brian was rather silent, just looking at Christina. A couple of minutes later, he interrupted me in the middle of the story. He gestured to Christine and said, Oh my God, Andy, have you ever landed on your feet? We all laughed, and luckily no one laughed harder than Emily. She knew she wasn't as beautiful as Christine, but she also knew that Brian adored her, and his admiration for Christine didn't bother her at all. As we walked to dinner, both women walking a few steps ahead of us, Brian quietly said to me, Are you two really, you know, dating? I nodded. So far, so good. To tell the truth, I have a hard time believing it myself. And she's not just beautiful. She's the whole package. Generous, cheerful, affectionate. Brian had already heard some of this story, in particular that Christina had also experienced infidelity. He said, I go, well, I think your common tragedy was a kind of luck, almost. I don't know about tragedy. It seems more common. Something like, we were both duped by selfish assholes. Well, it doesn't matter, he said. He put his hand on my shoulder. I'm very happy for you, Andy. It looks like everything is going really well, more than well. I smiled at him as we walked to our table behind two lovely women chatting together. I'm living the dream, buddy, I said. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.